Hey there guys, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogachan, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Today we're gonna go back and do another video on data engineering vocabulary because, well, let's just be clear, there is way too much uh, vocabulary out there for data engineers to know. So let's go over some key terms that you should know if you're breaking into the industry and you want to be a better data engineer. So let's just jump into it right now. Starting right away, let's talk about CDC. And no, I'm not talking about the Center for Disease Control. I'm talking about change data capture. If you've ever delved into the world of streaming versus ingestion, you've likely come across this possible format and process of streaming data. At least that's one way you can use this. In theory, again, there's multiple ways you can actually do CDC, and we'll talk about a few of them here in a second. But most of the time, people refer to it as a method to stream data. As the name sort of suggests, only sort of, uh, the purpose of this method is to capture any change in, well, data, specifically in your database. So generally this approach of capturing data uh, basically will take data that changes over time. And as each new event occurs, we'll capture every one of those and then push it over to your data warehouse or maybe just data lake. The point is usually there's a couple of different ways you can do this. The common way is to often read your log. For example, with Postgres, you might have your write ahead log, which is another uh, word we might have to explain at some point, but your write ahead log. Um, I'm going to make a video about uh, terms you should know from software to be a better data engineer. And that's kind of one of them that I want to dig into. That generally you write before you kind of put all of that data into some sort of complex, most likely index or something. Um, that way, if anything were to occur, you ha either have that data captured or you don't. So generally any action that occurs on certain entities, e.g. tables in your data warehouse are captured in these logs. You can then often point some sort of tool towards these logs and then it will capture every change. But that is only one form of CDC. There's honestly a whole plethora of them. You could also use something like a trigger on a table to push any change to a table. That basically once you know you insert something, you automatically push some message somewhere. You can also do things like audit columns and uh, delta tables, but Honestly, the most common I've seen are either log uh, table connections or uh, triggers. Um, triggers have their own complications, so that's why you don't always see them. And for anyone who hasn't seen a database trigger, here it is. Uh, I've only used them like three or four times. So it's honestly not the most common thing, but it does occur and there are benefits to having triggers. So that's what CDC is. It's kind of attached to streaming data. It's not the only use case, but it's definitely, at least for data engineers, a common use case of why we implement something that involves CDC. Next, a term you'll often hear is normalization versus denormalization. So you'll hear someone say like, oh, this table has been heavily denormalized, or you know, we've used some sort of like third normal form um, for our either database and very rarely your data warehouse but some people do like that uh, approach when it comes to designing your data warehouse. So this is kind of a spectrum of how you can store data. And if you haven't learned about like first, second, third uh, normal form, and then there's a few technically after that, this might be a little confusing. It's like, what do I mean when I say normalization? Normalization, when referring to database design techniques, is a method in design to basically eliminate certain things such as duplicate uh, data that could exist either in the same table, multiple tables, uh, maybe having columns that have multiple values in them. And I'll put up kind of a picture that kind of shows you first, second, and third normal form here so you can kind of get an idea. It also tries to eliminate other oddities and, and issues that occur during like insertion of data, updating of data and other anomalies. Basically the way you can think about it is when you need to insert data, if you have to constantly update multiple fields or update multiple rows all at once because you're making a small change, it poses a lot of risk. So you're kind of also de-risking data. There's again, a ton of other benefits, but at the same time, you've now created a ton of different tables, right? Now you've got every specific entity, including relationships that are broken down into specific tables. In some cases, they call this like vertexes and edges. You could call this relationships. The point is there's a lot of things that are now like entities, relationships, and they're all broken up. And in order to put it all back together, you kind of have to know how it all fits. And that's hard. That takes a lot of uh, thought, sometimes um, business logic, and all of that means risk of doing it wrong. And thus, that's where you start seeing things like denormalization 
come into play, especially for data engineers who often take this very normalized data set and denormalize it for analysts to use. That way they're not having to deal with this crazy monstrosity of, you know, writing 30 different joins just to get all this data together. That's one of the reasons you'll see the one big table approach when it comes to designing some sort of like data warehouse table. You might see people first do something like a data warehouse and then take that data warehouse and then build one big table that's basically a heavily denormalized table where all of the data exists. And in order, if you wanted to update all this information would be very, very hard, right? Like now, if you wanted to update, let's say one user's information in this one big table, it'd be very hard because there's multiple instances of the row, this user, because they've had multiple activities. So if they've changed their state, but only for certain parts of the year, let's say for where they live, well, you've made it very complicated. Heavily normalized table is great for transactional processing of operations kind of databases, but it's not as great for analysts who maybe need to kind of work with all that data. Next, uh, another technique that you might occasionally hear, and this is somewhat, again, connected to streaming, is pub sub. And no, I'm not talking about the Florida sandwich, which I was just made aware of. That's kind of funny. No, PubSub, when you refer to that, actually stands for publisher subscriber, which is a design pattern where you have some sort of publisher, essentially, that will be pushing out messages that fit into a topic and pushing it to a certain topic. And then some sort of subscriber that is listening to that topic and then pushing those messages and doing something with it. And this is specifically focused on distributed systems because when you're having you know tons and tons of messages that are coming in, you need both your publishers often and your subscribers to maybe scale up and down. And then all those messages to go into some sort of queue that's often kind of like a topic uh, and the subscribers to read them in a way that makes sense. Generally, what you'll often hear this with is things like Kafka. Um, in the Kafka model, you might hear things like producers and consumers, but it's kind of the same idea, right? Like something creates a message, pushes it into some sort of message queue, and then something listens to that queue based on a specific topic, because you can have multiple, obviously, topics that could be going on, and then something else does something with it. And this kind of helps you create this distributed system where everything can kind of get managed depending on how uh, things are growing or, or, or shrinking. In fact, recently, uh, more just because it's funny, I heard someone say that Kafka wasn't good enough for what they were trying to handle, so they developed their own, and I find that kind of funny because truthfully, Kafka is built to scale. Um, I'm sure it hits a limit at some point, and I'm sure some of you have hit it. I haven't, but you know, there are companies that do billions uh, of messages probably a day. Um, and yeah, you might hit a limit in that pub sub uh, world. The reason it is that way is because as it scales, it needs to be simple enough to scale to that, to that massive scale. Because if you had tons of moving pieces, it really wouldn't work. Next, you'll often hear something like execution plan or sometimes query plan or sometimes query execution plan. I've honestly heard a mix of all of it. The point is what this is, is generally the query engine trying to tell you how it will likely run your query before it actually runs it. You can actually run it and then often you'll have something like explain plan, which will tell you exactly what did happen. But in theory, the execution plan should tell you what will occur. Now, why this is important is you often need to figure out like, what types of joins are being uh, basically are occurring, you know, as you're trying to join to uh, different columns? Is it using the index? Is it not using the index? Is it trying to join all of the data? Um, is it just going to the exact data it should be? Because again, it's using the index. Which one of the indexes um, is it using? If you use a where clause, when is it actually getting implemented? And you can see a lot of this because a good execution plan will tell you everything from what it's using, uh, if it's using an index, if it's basically running over a certain amount of data, it should tell you in general how long it took you to go through each step. And then if you need to improve the performance, you can kind of go through and be like, oh, whatever step X was the slowest component. So I know where I need to focus my effort to improve this whole process. I either need to shrink down the data that's getting processed here. I might need to add an index, which who knows these days, you might not need to add an index anymore because we're only using cluster keys. I know that uh, Snowflake is working on indexes, but the point is, you know, that's a little bit changing, but especially if you're like on Postgres or something, or even SQL Server, that might still be a thing that you need to consider. And Snowflake also has something similar. So you can see Snowflake's right here. And if you need to improve your performance, it's a great place to start because it tells you what exactly is occurring. So you're not having to just blindly guess, like maybe this join or that join is, is causing issues. So that's why like oftentimes people will say like, hey, uh, if you wanna sound impressive on an interview, talk about that because not a lot of people do. And especially now that we're going into a world where not all databases maybe either offer it or maybe it doesn't make sense to because maybe you can't control enough of the underlying uh, system to, to do much. 
if you want to sound like you know a little more, that's an opp that's an opportunity. Um, so learn a bit, little bit about that. I'll put up a few articles here that you can learn a little bit and then maybe some in the links below. Next, let's talk about data lineage. Now you'll often hear this and it can kind of come across a little bit selly because a lot of vendors will add this into um, their product as a feature. All data lineage means is kind of what it sounds like, which is like, where did this data come from? And if you have a really good data lineage system, it will literally tell you from source all the way to final product, how that data has been used, processed, et cetera, in like a diagram. And it's great. Like at Facebook, we had a really good system here where you could literally see the picture essentially of the diagram. You could click through the different files that actually were the code um, that edited your data essentially through that whole process. So you could literally track things as they went from point A all the way to point Z, you know, whatever dashboard it hit. And this becomes really important, especially as you're trying to make updates on code, or if you're just trying to eliminate columns or something similar, because if you change things and you don't know why you're changing them or where you're changing them, and you're not sure what the impact will be when you change it, this is a great place to start. Because once you kind of know how that data gets processed through this whole thing, you can kind of go and reach out to people. If you've got a good uh, set of data lineage systems, you can literally probably have some sort of automated script say, hey, I'm going to change all this information. And so it's really handy to have a solid data lineage system. Now let's round out today with something a little less technical, at least it's not purely technical, and that is data governance. And data governance isn't the most exciting subject, but it is arguably Maybe not the most important, but a very important subject when it comes to managing data. Um, if you've ever seen this circle of data governance, I'm gonna pop it up here. It comes from DEMA. Uh, I love it because it kind of tells you the different important aspects of data governance. Whether it's data quality or data management, it's up there. Now, data governance is basically a collection of processes, roles, policies, standards, and metrics that ensure the effective and efficient use of information in enabling organizations to achieve their goals. Now, that's a ton of words and jargon, but basically the purpose is to take all of this data use that we're trying to drive and making sure it's actually both useful, but also repeatable, replicatable, uh, reliable. It's all these things that we kind of take for granted. You know, if you're just constantly doing like one-off data projects and not having some sort of governance, it doesn't have to be crazy depending on how large your company is, but having some layer of governance that makes sure that what you're implementing actually can be relied upon. I mean, that is essentially the goal to a degree. Like there's more than just that. There's some security aspects as well. So not just reliable, but also again, secure as we are getting into a world where there is definitely a risk of increased breaches. There's a lot of reasons for data governance. You know, it wasn't that long ago that Facebook had an issue where an employee left data in a car um, on a thumb drive, unencrypted that anyone could then plug in and it got stolen. And one could argue that there's some level of data governance that should have occurred because there was like SSNs and other very PII information on there um, that people now have risk of being lost. And so that's kind of part of the data governance over umbrella where it's like that would have been managed. Now there was a ton of important terms here. So I, one, hope you learned something useful. Two, if I missed something, first check out the video. Um, I'll link it below for part one of this. And two, if I didn't cover it in either of these, hey, please let me know and I'll make a third version of this. I'm um, going over data vocabulary again. So thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thanks and goodbye everyone. Yeah.